A top secret government computer program comes back to haunt the U.S. Tonight, you'll see how that program is now being connected to multiple local murder cases. It's 11 o'clock, time for news. The Promise Computer Program. Database and pattern recognition software was a new source of information and power in the early 1980s. It starts when the program's designers, Inslaw Corporation, accused the U.S. Justice Department of stealing the software for their own foreign policy purposes. This programmer testified he altered the program to create what's called a back door to allow government spying. This happened while working on Cabazon Indian sovereign land. Well, the parties that were involved in the uh, distribution of this software uh, were involved in covert operations and they were involved in uh, uh, Nicaragua and Central America and they were involved in uh, operations in the Middle East. This U.S. Justice Department memo from 1985 shows the Promise software was being sold to Middle Eastern arms dealers and wanted no paperwork or customs inspections to interfere. Even unsolved mysteries got on the case when the last journalist to investigate this spy scandal was found dead in his hotel room. Danny Casalero's wrists were slashed in 1991. It was ruled a suicide. But his reporter notes disappeared, and the book on the conspiracy he was to title Indio was never finished. Congressional hearings were held in 1992. It describes the committee's investigation into serious allegations that high-level Department of Justice officials were involved in a criminal conspiracy to force Inslaw, a small computer company, out of business. And remember Judge Basin, who found in favour of Inslaw against the Justice Department. Well, a few months later, Judge Basin's reappointment to the bench, thought to be a formality, was blocked by the Justice Department. Yeah. His career has been destroyed. From an office in India to foreign capitals all over the world, several murder investigations are connected to this spy scandal. And the number of uh, murders that have occurred uh, to uh, prevent uh, leaks uh, are incredible. There's nearly 50 murders that can be directly ascribed uh, to this pattern of activity. You have a, a case of forensic artistry, you know, shall we say, where you have professionally trained people that set up a crime scene and they make it phenomenally difficult for investigators to, uh, to backtrack, make a murder look like a suicide. Bad things seem to happen to people who make waves in the Inslaw affair. Earlier this year, Michael Riconosciuto contacted Bill Hamilton and signed a sworn affidavit for Hamilton's lawsuit against the Justice Department. Almost immediately, Riconosciuto was contacted by a Justice Department official and given a very clear message. Back off or else. Less than two weeks after that threat, Michael Riconosciuto was arrested on drug charges. My main concern right now is staying alive and protecting my family. I think it's about time to get the whole story out. His name is Ari Ben Menashe. He's a former Israeli intelligence agent. Once it's out, there's no reason to hurt me physically anymore. And today, he is hiding in Australia, in fear, he says, of his life. So many people in the last 10 years who were working for the various governments on these issues, due to cover-ups, died mysteriously. Just recently, Gordon, I, I interviewed uh, Mr. William Hamilton, the president of right. Law, mm. and we talked to him about how uh, the Israeli Mossad stole his promised software. That's right. And you brought that out first in your book, Seeds of Fire. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what I, didn't, what I didn't know until I read uh, this new book, uh, Robert Maxwell, Israel Super Spy, was that Robert Maxwell basically was the salesman yep. for Promise. He's the one who took it and marketed it around the world. Well, let's back up and, and talk about first how Israel got their hands on the Inslaw Promise software. Well, it was the most brilliant coup pulled off by that most brilliant spy master of all, Rafi Aitan of Mossad. Mossad was the creation of spy masters like Rafi Aitan. I enjoyed it. I say, I enjoyed it, I loved it, I uh, felt it, I felt as I'm creating 
something from nothing. For me, the Mossad was like uh, a studio to the artist. Okay? That means a place where I could shape my creation. And Mossad was created in a very aggressive image. As deputy head of operations, Rafi would order his agents to blackmail, steal and murder. It's very easy to kill a man. With your hands? Yeah. Have you tried it? No. Well, luckily. Mossad openly boasts it's different from other secret services. Its agents are licensed to kill by their government, prepared to ignore international law to achieve their ends. For more than 20 years, Rafi Atan commanded hitmen from the 12th floor of this Tel Aviv office block. Mossad is still pursuing its enemies today with government approval from the highest level. What rules do you have when it comes necessary to kill someone? Well, here you are coming to a, a, a tricky business of government, okay? It depends on the circumstances. He, at the time, was in his late uh, middle years, but extraordinary man. You have to think of Rafi like a small tank is the best way to describe him. He is physically so powerful. He has also got this amazing ability to change his appearance with just a minimum of disguise. And he said, you know, all this stuff about beards and all this stuff for this guy's is all nonsense, he said. All you need to do, he said, is put cotton wadding in your cheeks or up your nose. Uh, you need to wear a pair of glasses. If you don't smoke, smoke. If you take a pipe, it's perfect if you don't use one. And that's it. And you may adopt a limp, he said. Now, the point is, he took on the guise, when he went to see Bill Hamilton at Inslaw, he took on the guise of a, per of a public prosecutor from Israel. What he'd done, he had got hold of this real public prosecutor's passport and just simply had his forgers slip Rafi's photograph into the um, passport. And he came, though he was wanted by U.S. Customs for questioning over other matters to do with intelligence operations against America, Rafi just bowled on through uh, Kennedy Airport. Nobody spotted him. Nobody says, that looks like Rafi at because he had just nicely disguised himself. And he turned up at um, Inslaw, and he went in, and he asked to see uh, how this might work, because at the time, Inslaw was selling it, of course, as a piece of software to use by public prosecutors to track down criminals. And Rafi said, there are plenty of these criminals, as you know, in Israel, unfortunately, laughing. He's, he, has, he has this funny little laugh, which is not really a laugh. It's like a chilling breeze that goes past you as, he, as it comes out of his mouth. And Bill Hamilton and Nancy Burke Hamilton and his small staff were totally taken in by Rafi. And he sat down, he had his tea with them and all that stuff. And only when he left, as Bill told me, did he realize something strange about this guy, but he didn't know what. Well, Rafi went back, and with a brilliant ploy, he went back to see his contact at the Justice Department because he had facilitated justice to get him into America by simply saying he was coming from the public prosecutor's office in Israel and would like to see the software he'd heard about. So he goes back, and he goes into the office of a man called Brewster, who is in charge of liaison with Inslaw, which is Hamilton's company. And Rafi says, so Bruce says, how did it go? And Rafi says, wonderful, very He says, oh, my God, he said, I forgot something. And Bruce says, politely, what did you forget? He said, I forgot to ask Mr. Hamilton for a copy of his software. Now, Rafi knew instinctively if he'd asked Bill for that copy, he would never have got it, of course, because Bill wasn't going to part of that priceless software of his. Brewster said, no problem, Mr. Uh, the name he's given as a public prosecutor, no problem. And he gave him a copy. And Rafi said to me, sometimes you don't have to work very hard to pull something off. And that's how he got it. 
He goes back to Israel now. A Justice Department official just literally handed yeah. to the one of yeah. the top Mossad yeah. agents yeah. handed the promise. Absolutely, software. and this, of course, has become a matter of huge grief for Mr. And Mrs. Hamilton and Inslaw, and uh, as you know, they are still battling through the courts to get justice for themselves without any success so far. But we were dumbfounded, couldn't conceive of it. Hamilton's contract with the U.S. Department of Justice to supply the Promise software was cancelled in 1982 without any real explanation. Only some time later did Hamilton hear that his software was turning up all over the world. Rafi goes back to Israel and he recognizes, well, I just can't lift this as it is. I need to do something more than that. And he sits down with that other rogue of the story, who is Ari ben Menashe, who'd worked for him. And Ari ben Menashe had been a very senior intelligence officer. They sat down, and Rafi sat there and said, what do we need, what do we need? He said, I know what we need. We'll deconstruct this, take it apart, rebuild it. Uh, but nobody can ever accuse us of stealing it because it'll look different. So his people took time to do that. They did it. But they then said, we need something else, Rafi said. We need to know what people are doing with this. And he said, I know what we need, a trapdoor. Modifications that enabled it to key in a special access code and gain entry to all the information on the computer. The Israelis said, we can do it, but we shouldn't build a trapdoor here because it may just may be traced by the CIA who are good at this or the British intelligence who are equally good trace back to us and then we have a problem. We need to be absolutely undetectable. So Ari Bemanashi said, I know a place. And he came to California and he talked to this guy he'd known some years ago who ran a little company in California and he persuaded him to build the trap and he gave him $5,000 in cash for it. And the guy said, I know it's no question time, but is this for Moss at an Harry said to him, as he told me, you're right, it's no question time, and laughed and walked away. I, I uh, uh, spent uh, several thousand man hours of uh, programming time with a programming team, uh, you know, developing that subset. This unlikely looking character is a computer genius. His name is Michael Riconosciuto, and he says he was in charge of modifying the Promise program so that it could be accessed by intelligence. So whoever was holding that master key could do what? Basically uh, break into it and spy. I basically had to change the communications protocol, which is how that software package interacts with other software packages already resonant in the computer system. Now, they installed the trapdoor. Then they had to test it. And so they went to another element in this story, a man called Earl Bryan, who's now doing time in the penitentiary for mass fraud and what have you. The man alleged to have helped organize this deal is a Reagan political crony called Earl Bryan and his payoff three years later on the Promise software. About an hour and a half outside Washington DC you'll find this place, Earl Bryan's multi-million dollar country estate. If you believe Michael Riconosciuto, it's the house Promise bought. Now, we'd like to bring you Earl Bryan personally denying that claim, but he's not being interviewed by anybody. All we got was this letter from his lawyers, threatening action if we so much as associate Earl Bryan's name with this story. And Earl Bryan had been very close to President Reagan and had, in fact, worked for him. He had the contacts to help make sure that certain elements in Iran would not make a deal with President Carter in 1980 so that President Carter could not recover in the polls and that Reagan would win the election. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that Just I... Just five minutes word. after Ronald Reagan took the oath of office, Iran announced that the hostages would be released. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free. Of 
Well, now what happened? He had a, at the time he had a company called Hadron, and this company was a specialist company. So, Raffi used this company to test out if the trapdoor would work, and they ran the test against their neighbour, Jordanian Intelligence, and it did work. Ari Ben Menashe confirms that Promise was sold to Israel, but claims the Israelis, unlike the Australians, were in on the secret. The whole idea was that we would study it, then would sell it to our neighbours, and then we could, by using telephone lines, get into their, uh, our neighbours' computers. Both Ari Ben Menashe and Rafi Aten came to the same conclusion very quickly. Earl Bryan, for all his brilliance and willingness and all this stuff, did not have the resources that they wanted. And they said one word, Robert said, Ben Menashe and Rafi completely said, yep, Maxwell. He's the man. So Maxwell was hauled in, and he immediately saw for himself this was a wonderful chance to make money. And he wasn't, didn't understand software at that stage, but my goodness me, he was on a fast learning curve. And he set off to sell Promise, which was the name of the software. And the ironic thing is, and the cheeky thing is, that Rafi Atan decided, and this is what really, really does tick off poor old Bill Hamilton, is this. Rafi Atan decided, oh, I'll keep that name, Promise. It's such a good name for selling. And so he stole it. Not he just, he stole the name as well. And he actually sold it as Promise. Oh, yeah, it's still sold as Promise. Now, he went off around the world. Maxwell then became not just super spy, but ultra super salesman. He went off around the world and he pulled it off brilliantly. They sold it to their allies as well, including Australia. The list of countries which allegedly bought the Promise software reads like a who's who of America's friends, as well as its most bitter enemies. Gordon, briefly explain to our listeners why Mossad wanted uh, uh, Maxwell to sell this Promise software to other government uh, agencies around the world. He sold it, I guess, to Canada and, uh, and, and European nations. What was, what was Mossad's hidden motive in getting this Promise software into the government computers of other nations? <coughs> well, very simply, it gave Mossad an inside track view of what was happening when everybody was using Promise. Sitting in Tel Aviv, Rafi Tan and his technicians would know exactly what was going on in those departments, in those people using it. For instance, with a single piece of paper, you can pretty well track anybody, that person's life, where he's done, his phone calls and so on. It's like a never-widening ripple that goes on and on, and the information is just priceless when it comes back because it's all sorted and coded for you and decoded and so on. Well, what he was able to do, for instance, he would go to the Russians and say, you need this to keep track of what your little friends in the, in the Soviet satellites are doing and questions that you're absolutely right. And Maxwell would demonstrate it, and the Russians, KGB, would have it. But what they didn't realize, sitting in Tel Aviv, there were people listening to what the KGB were doing. <laughs> it became extraordinary because Maxwell enabled the Israelis. They were able to listen in to the Syrians. Maxwell sold it at cut price lots to the Egyptians. He sold it everywhere. Gordon, was the CIA uh, aware of the trapdoor? Uh, or Not was initially, it? because they were building their own version of Promise, which they'd also got from Justice. So this, and, this went for years with only the uh, Israeli Mossad knowing yeah, about yeah, the trapdoor. Yeah, yeah. Robert Maxwell intimately involved with that. His twin daughters, Christine and Isabel, were intimately involved in the affairs of the front company he used to sell that bug software to U.S. national laboratories, uh, including Sandia National Laboratory. And... Um, so that Israel could continue spying on nuclear secrets. A lot of this, uh, you know, goes back to the same Israeli spy master, Rafi Aiton, who was running the now uh, defunct Israeli intelligence agency, Lakim, that was focused on scientific espionage. Um, and it was largely focused on uh, U.S. nukes to a huge degree. One of the things that's in this book that just really uh, uh, opened my eyes, st stunned me, was uh, Gordon's uh, uh, revelation of the, of the relationship between Robert Maxwell and former Texas U.S. Senator John Tower, who was at one time probably the most powerful member of the U.S. Senate. 
Uh, Gordon, but uh, let's talk about uh, uh, John Tower's involvement. How did how did uh, uh, Tower get involved with Robert Maxwell, and what did Maxwell use Tower to do? Well, originally, um, Israel arranged for Henry Kissinger to facilitate the introduction to um, Tower. Maxwell wanted Tower for Israel to be his door opener into the Reagan administration, and more important of all, to be his door opener into the nuclear arsenal of America, which was Los Alamos. Tower at the time, as you know, had just retired from his post as uh, chairman of the uh, Senate Armed Forces Committee. He knew everybody in the intelligence forces everywhere. And so Maxwell struck a deal with Tower. He would pay him $200,000 a year, plus wonderful bonuses, in any currency he wanted, in any bank he wanted in the world, because Maxwell had banks everywhere. And, in fact, Tower became his door opener. So Israel had a door opener in Maxwell. Maxwell had a door opener in Tower. Tower became the man who would usher in Robert Maxwell in to see Reagan, uh, uh, Attorney General Meese, anybody he wanted. And it was Max, it was Tower who finally and speedily arranged for Robert Maxwell to sell a doctored version of Promise with a trapdoor to the Sandia Laboratories in Los Alamos. Tower, was, wait, wait, wait a minute. John Tower, former senator of Texas, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. enabled, helped Robert Maxwell to sell the Promise software with the Israeli Mossad trapdoor to our, to our nuclear laboratory at Los yep. Alamos, which, yep. which and gave the, the Israelis a, a window into Los Alamos. Correct, and we substantiate every word of that by the FBI documents we have obtained with the help of Bill uh, Hamilton, and we've obtained elsewhere, which show exactly how the FBI had tried to track this, and we detail how the then director of the FBI found his moves blocked, almost certainly from the White House, almost certainly with people at the level of uh, Bill Casey of the CIA, uh, Wein, um, Weinberger, and people like that. A lot of people suddenly decided it was not a good idea to have uh, this investigation into what, how Maxwell had got into Los Alamos. And that's very frightening because, in fact, it was power, his influence, his power still, that blocked off the investigation. Uh, Gordon, now, at that time, was was it William Webster who was uh, FBI? William director? Webster was the head of the FBI. And so and Webster, was all, he was on to this uh, scandal, and, and he was yep. trying to investigate the Israeli Mossad penetration yep. of Los Alamos, but yep. high-level Reagan White House operatives yep. blocked the FBI yep. investigation. That's right, and it's to this day it's blocked, and it's amazing, because to this day you will never get to the bottom of that. I mean, there's been many attempts, and we've come as close as anybody, I think, in what we've detailed. But, you know, it was extraordinary because he, I mean, we have actually his uh, pitch speech, his Maxwell's pitch speech to Sandia, which is a marvelous. It's a wonderful piece of theater he puts himself through. And the result is he sells the document, he sells it, and it's in there. Now, what happened was that when the FBI became suspicious, having been alerted by their field stations, uh, they're blocked off, and they can't do anything. And Maxwell got away with that with the help of Tower. Tower was so extraordinary, because Tower gave additional respectability to Maxwell's kind of cover. Uh, was was he, John Tower aware of the hidden motive of Robert Maxwell? Oh, yeah. Thought? There's no question about it. John Tower knew, and John Tower took the Maxwell dollar, if you like, or the Maxwell shilling. So you're saying John Tower, I mean, he was a traitor to the United States of America. This was You a, could this say was that a, in the simplest way. He was a traitor in that sense. But this guy was except, a, r- a right-wing Republican U.S. senator from the state of Texas, yep, and yep. he sold us down the river. Yep, and you know, the point is, he did it because he was greedy, and licentious. A and <laughs> he, had a, he had a reputation for, for you know, hard living and drinking. That was one reason. He, he, I think he, you know, his, his nomination was turned down as Secretary of Defense. Right. They, you know, right. they tried to get him into the Defense Department. Yes, yes. He became, next to Maxwell, a priceless asset for Mossad because he would tell Maxwell everything. Maxwell would feed straight back to Tel Aviv. Maxwell took him to uh, Bulgaria. He took him to Central Europe. 
he took him everywhere. And so Tower all the time was talking because he did have a, a serious problem with young girls and uh, heavy booze. And Maxwell used all this. And Tower is, to me, as much a traitor as anybody else I've come across in a long time in the history of America. They won't like this, the Republicans. But the fact is he was... And he was very dangerous. And what he's done, we'll never know how much Mossad owe to Tower 